I'm here to present uh, some work that I did with a bunch of collaborators, a bunch of students uh, at NYU, also an undergraduate at the University of Washington, and some faculty collaborators uh, at uh, UBC. So the platform I'm going to be talking to you about today is called NetCheck. It's a uh, tool. F oh, sorry. Hold, hold on a sec. Um, this is so embarrassing. Um, hey, hey, uh, hey. Hey. Uh, I'm in the middle of a, a talk right now, actually. Um, oh, hello. Uh, looks it, it, it looks like um, maybe the bad connection saved me a little bit there. Um, so, so yeah. So, um, well, th this was really embarrassing, um, and I feel that probably everybody in this room has had a similar part of embarrassment where you've had a Skype call that all of a sudden has dropped out in the middle of your Skype call. And it's a big, complicated application like Skype. Thank you. Um, it's a big, complicated application like Skype. And you, know, you want to be able to troubleshoot this. It's on some real network somewhere. Uh, I don't know how many of you I fooled, by the way, but the fact that a Skype call even connects on this conference Wi-Fi should have been a giveaway, that this was a, a video. Um, Anyway, so, so my friend had a message that she was trying to say. She was asking, how about we get together for some hot something or other? And it dropped out. Um, well, what do we do from now? Uh, you know, how do we troubleshoot this so that we don't have this problem again? That's really what this talk is about, is how do we troubleshoot this? And how can someone who's maybe not the most technical person be able to actually have an understandable solution to their problem? OK. So um, as I said, our goal, we have off-the-shelf black box applications we don't know anything about. We have very large complicated networks uh, that are like we have in the real internet today where there's firewalls, there's packets uh, being censored, there's uh, people on airplanes and trains and stuff like that trying to communicate, and we want some kind of understandable output to come out of this. So there's a bunch of different kind of candidate solutions you can imagine. One of them is that you go and you do probing with some tool like ping. This would be something that many of you would use to debug it. But actually, you often don't get the same result for this because you're sending a different type of traffic. Routers and things handle this differently. OK, so that doesn't really work. Maybe what you can do is you can do packet capture with something like Wireshark. And uh, this will give you a lot of information, but it really requires somebody who knows a lot about protocols and applications. I know my friend Esmeralda can't figure this out. I don't even know that I can look at a packet trace from Skype and figure out what's going wrong. OK. so. Another thing that a lot of researchers have proposed is what we could do is we could model applications. We could take and build a model of something like Chrome. We could model Apache. We could model the things here. And this would be a good way for us to go and find bugs uh, with those applications. And that's true. It would be great. But you need to build a model for every application then. And that just really doesn't scale and is really problematic. OK. So um, finally, an other people have proposed, well, maybe we could look at the network devices. We could look at all the hardware. We could look at their configurations and their setups. And we could use this to try to find problems with the network. And this would work, but you imagine you have all these different ISPs, and they're not going to give you all their configuration information stuff in real time. So once again, maybe not the most usable solution, especially not for you know me trying to talk to a friend of mine halfway across the world. OK. Hmm. So. We've gone and we've tried to look at all the things that are, are common and things that we could kind of do to try to address this problem. So we're stuck now. What do we do? Well, the key insight in this work is that there's one other element that's not up here on the slide that's common that we can use. And we can use this to figure out um, sort of uh, areas for further investigation to find the root cause of network bugs. And this is that applications are written by human programmers. And human programmers make mistakes, but they don't make mistakes perfectly randomly. Human programmers tend to have misconceptions about the network because you know, um, maybe the, the APIs that they're using or the way that they think about networks is, is maybe not perfectly accurate with respect to the complexity of the internet today. And this has actually been well known and well documented through a series of things called Deutsch's fallacies that look at uh, issues that people have with understanding and, and reasoning about networks, the things that programmers do. So what we'll do is we'll build a model of the network that 
is the same sort of way someone would view the network if they had these misconceptions, these simplifications, and we'll look for areas where this deviates from what we observe in practice and use this to find bugs. That's the kind of key insight in this work. Okay, so um, overall, our system is going to take traces from normal applications and failures with them uh, using off-the-shelf tools like K-Trace or S-Trace that do system call tracing, so no modifications to OSs or apps or anything else. Um, we will take those traces. We will go through a process where we order and model the calls uh, in a kind of uh, iterative back-and-forth fashion. And then from that, we will get information that we use to diagnose the root cause problem. We will spit the information out, and that, uh, some of that information will be very useful for network administrators, and some will be useful to the average Internet user. Okay. So um, I've just motivated and gone over an overview of what we're doing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about trace ordering um, and uh, uh, before I continue on and talk about the rest of the talk. So basically what traces are is they're a series of locally ordered system calls. So you have an application running on a local system, and tools like strace will print out calls that are made and other information about them. Um, we're not using anything where we have to modify applications to add extra tracing information or some kind of global clock because we want to be able to use off-the-shelf black, black box applications and off-the-shelf black box networks. Um, and so you'll see a format like you see here where listen has some call arguments there, three and one, and uh, the receive call down below, uh, to the right of it, it has the return value. But in some cases, some calls uh, like receive, receive you actually pass in a buffer and then the result of the received data gets, gets put into the buffer. And the way this is represented by strace and the way I represent it on these slides is to list the returned information on the left side as though it was an argument. Okay. All right. So um, what we actually get from these different hosts are we get different unordered or different locally ordered traces from each host like this. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to reconstruct what actually happened. So we want to turn this series of separate traces into something that looks more like this, where let's say this is what you would have if you had a clock that was synchronized across the nodes and you knew the correct exact order of every single call here. Um, but in fact, you don't, you know, this is really, really hard to get. This is essentially unobtainable to get without serious hardware or massive changes. So our real goal here isn't to get the exact ground truth as it occurred, but to get something where there's an equivalent ordering um, where the calls would have the same, uh, the same behavior. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. So if we look at these two traces, at the beginning, at the top of both calls, uh, they each create a socket. And um, what the order in which those socket uh, creation calls occur is actually immaterial to the behavior of the system. It doesn't matter if A gets their socket descriptor before B or vice versa. So we could actually put those in any order, and it would be equivalent. Okay? So that's an example of equivalence. The other, the other property that uh, we have an observation about here is that the return values actually tell you, in many cases, what order calls that may depend on each other will occur in. So here we have a connect call and a listen call, and we see that the connect call has a return value of zero. Well, um, You'll notice that the order in which you do connect with respect to listen makes a difference. If you try to connect before the other side has listened, then you'll get a connection refused error. So we can use the return value of zero from connect as a hint that connect actually came after the listen call. Okay? And uh, we call this relationship between those calls, we call it as connect um, has this may depend on relationship with listen. So um, you can go, and, and you'll see I have the connect has the may depend on relationship with listen. You can go and you can derive this um, call ordering property for all the POSIX system calls, and you can use this to recover the trace order uh, within a system. So let me walk you through an example about how this works. So here uh, we have a similar but slightly changed example here where there's a, a, a five-line uh, trace from host A and a three-line trace from host B that's listed at the bottom. Um, and those are represented by the input traces on the, the um, top uh, left portion of this. The, uh, every call you'll see has an arrow pointing up to the call before it, which is a way of saying that locally the calls are written in the correct order. Okay, so what NetCheck will do is it will uh, choose one of the calls. It could choose either the call from A or B. In this example, we just had it choose the call from A arbitrarily because, once again, there, there's equivalent uh, ordering between the two. It doesn't matter which one. NetCheck will consume that call, and uh, it 
produces it uh, here as output ordering. This is just an illustration to show um, where we're at within the process of consuming the calls. Uh, it, it doesn't actually do this within the algorithm. Um, but what has happened is, is NetCheck processes that socket call, um, and then it's ready to move on and perform other calls. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here to the point at which it's processed the socket and bind calls and is now ready to try listen and connect. And as you may recall, uh, connect may depend on listen. So it has to try connect first. It tries to perform a connect, but it cannot perform the connect because the return value of connect is different than what was observed in the actual trace. So as a result, the model rejects um, the, uh, the ability to process the connect call now. As a result, what will happen is NetCheck will not consider connect and will actually go on and consider the listen call. It can process listen, uh, this call correctly, and then following this, it will be able to correctly uh, process the connect call uh, sub, you know, uh, after this. All right, so now I'm going to jump ahead to the end to show you an example of a, a final situation. So now I've gone and I've added the TCP buffer to the slide here, so you can see um, some of the state inside of the model on, on node A is an empty TCP buffer. So uh, since receive may depend on send, receive is going to depend on data that may be put in place by send, we have to try receive first. Well, receive is trying to receive the string ola at the bottom there with an empty buffer. So, of course, it can't do this because it doesn't have OLA inside of the buffer to receive. If you call receive, there's nothing there. So we reject this order. Then we go and we try to process send with the string hello. So um, send processes hello, the call's accepted, and, and hello is put into the TCP buffer um, uh, for node A, for this uh, socket communication at node A. Now uh, the host is going to go, or now the receive call is going to try to be processed, with the string hola. However, the problem is, is that hello is what's actually stored within the buffer. So um, this will be rejected uh, by NetCheck. NetCheck will say something horrible has gone wrong here. There's a middle box or something in the middle that's changing traffic. Something is going on here, and it will reject the ordering. So those are the three behaviors that a NetCheck model can have uh, based upon um, uh, you know, trying to perform an action is accept, reject, and fatal error uses accept and reject as clues for ordering, and it uses fatal error to abort when something has gone wrong. So the way that this simplified network model works is it, um, it, it goes and it basically tracks uh, data that's sent. So it'll track things like when you go to send a datagram, this is put in a data structure corresponding to the other side of the socket. And um, we go and we make assumptions, things like uh, data being sent, being lost, being delivered is all normal. If things like reordering or duplication occur, these are things that many programmers are not expecting. And so we will actually raise, uh, we will actually um, return an issue to the fault uh, classification system, which I'll talk about next, as uh, flagging this as a potential issue for further uh, discussion. Uh, and so the network model is just kind of a simple simulator, you can almost think of it, that, that acts the way that um, a, a programmer might expect that it would behave, that the network would behave. And uh, as we saw before, it can have different outcomes like accept, reject, and permanent reject, depending on what's occurred. So uh, it captures a lot of very simplified programmer assumptions in terms of we assume that there's transitive connectivity, which I think we all know isn't really true on the internet. We assume that there's very little random loss and that there's no middle boxes that make any transformations that are uh, visible to the applications that show up in the application traces. And we also assume that different operating systems process the same socket calls the same way, which um, I'm sure as most of you have written socket code at one point or another, you've probably discovered this is in no way the case. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, really quick, one property of our trace ordering algorithm is that um, the runtime of it is actually linear in the, uh, in the total length of the traces. And so uh, it, this is assuming you have a constant number of traces. And so um, as we'll see in a minute, it's actually very, very fast on real traces because we're not doing any kind of exponential uh, backtracking or anything like that within the algorithm. Okay, so now that I've talked a bit about trace ordering and the network model, I'm going to talk about fault classification, which is um, basically how the system figures out what output to, to produce. So... Um, 
one thing it could do is we could spit out an enormous amount of information, and this would actually be very hard for users to comprehend. Essentially, we would be hiding uh, the useful information within the noise of everything that we generate. And um, so what the fault classifier does is it looks at patterns of misbehavior within the application or within the application traces and tries to use those to understand if there's some higher level property at work. So, for example, if you have loss, it could be that you have non-transitive connectivity. It could be that there's an MTU issue. It could be a node is moved from one place to another. It can be all sorts of different issues, and they all look like loss, but it's different patterns of loss. So the fault classifier looks, looks at loss across multiple different flows and state within the whole system and uses this to figure out what sort of information is useful to a network debugger or to uh, an end user. And um, there's two uh, basic user bases that NetCheck is meant to be useful for. The first, uh, the, the top two uh, areas here are meant for network administrators, and this provides detailed information about um, which calls succeeded, why they didn't, you know, why they succeeded or failed in certain ways, and information about traffic statistics within the system. The uh, bottom area here, uh, the end users will use the option that just shows the bottom area, and this basically just says, here's exactly what's wrong, and here's what we recommend that you do about it in order to, uh, to fix the problem. So, hey, you have an MTU issue. Here's a link to tell you what this actually means. If you switch networks, then this will probably go away, and you can send your network admin on the network you're on, if you know who they are, a link, and maybe they can figure out how to fix it. Okay. So now that we've talked about the system, let's, uh, let's see how it actually works in practice. So in order to evaluate this, we went through and we searched for network-related bugs on bug trackers for popular, widely used software. And we replicated these bugs, the traces from them, and ran them within NetCheck. And we were very pleasantly surprised that NetCheck actually collect correctly and, uh, provides information about more than 95% of these bugs. So it's, it's rather remarkably accurate um, with, uh, with traces gathered from widely used software, Python, Apache, et cetera. Uh, and there's a lot more details about this in the paper and also in a, in a tech report on our site. Uh, we also had a network administrator uh, replicate 20 faults that they had observed in practice on their network. Um, so these are meant to be more kind of problems that a network admin can observe. Um, and we used uh, uh, um, applications and we traced those applications and we tried to see how well we detected them. We found a wide variety of problems, and in this case, we found 90% of the cases we correctly identified the root cause problem. Um, and in many cases, we also pointed out additional supplemental issues that were not directly the root cause, but were in you know, some other misconfiguration or some other problem that was auxiliary to what was going on. Um, we've also used this in, in practice uh, in, in a few different situations. I had a student who used this with a bunch of real applications uh, in, his, in his sort of daily um, use of software over about a week. And we found um, bugs either in the network or the applications themselves for five different very popular applications. Um, so this is production networks, production, production applications, uh, normal use. And this is also a tool that we use a lot on the Seattle testbed. Uh, Seattle is, is, as was mentioned before, it's kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer version of Planet Lab. Planet Lab sort of software running on laptops and smartphones and tablets and things. It's an open platform uh, that we've had more than 3,000 developers use. So if you're interested in doing experiments uh, from real, like, home networks, not just kind of, you know, well-provisioned Linux boxes on, on the uh, GERN uh, or Internet 2, then uh, we invite you to, to give it a look. But it's, uh, NetCheck has been very effective at finding problems we have there. And now um, I'm going to talk briefly about performance before I conclude. So on the y-axis here, we have the runtime that it took NetCheck to, uh, to produce its output. On the x-axis is the size of the trace. And so what you can see here is, is that, um, you know, until the traces get to be very large, like over a gigabyte or so, NetCheck is extremely fast. Uh, we can use it in, in uh, you know, in under a minute for, for most types of applications. Even if you run an application for you know, five, ten, you know, minutes, an hour, or something like that, it's still feasible to go through and run NetCheck and have NetCheck uh, process it. Um, so a, most, you know, a lot of the time that it spends is actually just reading in the trace file. Okay, so uh, to quickly conclude, 
we built and evaluated a system, NetCheck. NetCheck is a tool that uh, is a, is diagnoses network failures in complex applications. And we had really two very key insights in this work that, that made it come together. The first and the primary was we want to look at programmers and how they believe systems work, and we wanted to use that insight to help us find bugs. We look for mismatches between what the programmer thinks is going to happen and, and what is actually observed with a trace. The second is, is that if you look at the relationship between calls and you look at the return values of calls, you can use this to reconstruct an order out of unordered traces. And this has uh, proven to be very effective uh, for us at, within the traces that we examine. So overall, NetCheck is extremely effective at looking at everyday applications and networks, and we found a significant number of real network and application bugs, identified them, and it requires no per-network knowledge or no per-application knowledge. The source code and documentation is all available on our site. Um, and using NetCheck, uh, we were able to figure out um, from the Skype call earlier, I was able to figure out what the problem was, reconnect with my friend Esmeralda, and figure out that she wanted to get together for some hot chocolate. So with that, I will take any questions. Hi, um, very nice talk. Um, I'm interested to know that does not check always require a complete trace. In other words, you always have to require a trace start from when you launch your application towards the failure happens. Well, it could be happening in the middle of the trace and towards the failure. Um, NetCheck does not require traces from all hosts. Our current implementation of NetCheck uh, does assume that you have the appropriate setup for sockets and things you're using. Mm. Um, it would not be a, a stretch for us to add something in to just create like normal socket state. Um, our actual implementation does not, but our techniques would trivially uh, apply to these situations. So we, we do deal with missing information, and it's, um, uh, yeah. Got you. Um, another related question would be, uh, looks like a lot of uh, application issues like involve like two parties in the, con in, the, in, the, in the connection. I was curious, would it extend to like hang out when a multiple persons participate in a session? Uh, sorry. So looks like a lot of application you show you have a server and a client, like two parties in, in a, in a, in a um, connection setup. I'm curious to see that. Uh, would you net check scale, scale to uh, multiple persons, oh, like yeah. a hangout? Something? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've used it for things like uh, BitTorrent and other stuff like that with like hundreds of participants, and it works just fine. Gotcha. Thanks. So, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, great talk. Um, Regard, so it seems that you're mostly co concerned about uh, connectivity issues. What about performance degradations and things like that? Like when Skype, for instance, completely downgrades your quality. Um, yes, if it's a performance issue, then that's not something that we've targeted with this work. Um, we're really focused on um, when you have an observable failure, like a call disconnection, or you know you can't reach somebody or something like that. But yeah, um, performance would be something that that um, would not work with the exact techniques we used out of the box due to the way that we do ordering. Thanks. Yeah. So I was curious, um, what type of middle box behaviors do you catch, or like how, how do the middle boxes come in here? Like, or are you just thinking about NATs or like more involved stuff? Um, it can be NATs. It can be um, if, if you have a box that's doing like s some sort of censorship. Issues. If you have boxes that are adding uh, additional content, like your ISP is adding ads into web pages that you retrieve, um, it, it it can be you know. So do you assume you have visibility variety. on what those boxes are doing, or are you just observing this at the end? No, point? you you have traces at the end. You don't have anything in the middle at all, and so we'll be able to detect that and say, aha, there's something funny going on here. And hey, if you switch networks, this is probably a problem. It's kind of what we say. Right. I mean, but this. I mean. That's that's great. Uh, it's just uh, you kept saying you know uh, user misconceptions. I mean this that's not a misconception, right? It's like a network problem. So because uh, go, going away from your talk, I, I feel like okay, this only works because users have this skewed vision of what the network should be doing, and they use it wrongly, right? Well, if if the but programmers that's not the case here. if the programmers written their application to correctly you know detect and somehow get around these application or these these middle boxes, uh, like if. Yeah, it's called encryption. 
Well, in, in some cases, but I mean, encryption is not going to do anything for a NAT. But anyway, so if if a user's or if the programmer's written their software to try to get around these things and they successfully have done so, then there isn't a failure in the first place.